Joe, I like I like the description of the book here. A workshop in a book designed to improve work, workplaces, and those who lead them. Because Lord knows we need a workshop when it comes to leadership in many, many cases. Well, bosses are under great pressure, and so are employees. We're asking people to do more with less. Change is a constant in workplaces. And who gave bosses training in how to manage change, how to manage the emotion, how to become better at collaboration, how to understand motivation and conflict resolution? Those weren't things that you necessarily got along the way. And so sometimes you just learn from your mistakes the way I did. And I teach from my mistakes, and I write about them in the book. Mm -hmm, Indeed. There's one other points you bring up in the book that can help those leaders to work better with those that they work with, and that is how to be a coach instead of a fixer, because Lord knows we've run into that once or (laughs) twice in our lives. Oh, you know, it is so tempting when you know how to do something as a boss to push the person aside and say, just a minute, I'll fix it for you. Okay, Mm -hmm. I'll do it. And yet, after you do it, you walk away and you say to somebody else, I am so tired of redoing that person's work. It takes more time to learn how to coach someone to discover how to do it themselves. But once you do that, once you learn how to be a coach instead of a fixer, and boy, I had to, I had to learn that. Mm-hmm. Once you learn how to coach, because it, it takes a bunch of it, a skill set that's pretty complex. You have to learn how to describe what it is you need. You have to describe what it is to, how what it takes to get there and what the end product should look like. But you can do it. And the cool part is that the other person discovers the answers himself or herself. And once I learned to be a coach instead of a fixer, I saw people thrive. And she and Jill Geisler learned those lessons from being the first female <laughs> news director of a major market television station in the U.S. <laughs> And according to what I'm reading here, one of Wisconsin's preeminent broadcast news directors, because I'm reading something off of the website for the Wisconsin Broadcasters Association Foundation Hall of Fame, of which you are now a member, inducted this past uh, June. Congratulations to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. You know, I always worry when someone talks about being a first because I'm still not quite sure that there weren't other women in this country who were doing that mm-hmm. job and maybe weren't getting as much attention for it. So so even though that claim has been made on my behalf, every now and then I'll look at an obit or something like that and say, <laughs> gosh, I think that person may have preceded me. So I don't claim any special, you know, <laughs> any special qualifications, but I sure am delighted that the Wisconsin Broadcasters is Association saw fit to lower its standards and bring me in. Oh, you stop that. <laughs> you were wonderful at your job, that's for certain. And it has to be a real thrill for you because growing up in the Milwaukee area, and you know, you hear all these wonderful names from uh, Wisconsin and Milwaukee's television and radio past, and to be among them now has to be a real thrill for you. Well, imagine the man who hired me, Carl Zimmerman, the wonderful Carl Zimmerman, uh, is in the Hall of Fame, and, and I get to have my name there near his. That's really got to be. That's got to be a thrill. What What interested you in getting into journalism in the first place, Joe? Hmm. I grew up in Milwaukee, and I always loved to write. I was editor of the Pulaski High School newspaper and went to the University of Wisconsin for a summer workshop for high school newspaper editors. I was the first kid in my family to go to college. And when I was up there for this high school uh, journalism workshop in the summer, many, many summers ago, they offered this optional side course in broadcast. Now, it wasn't about being on TV. They just handed us these Bell and Howell 16-millimeter film cameras that weighed about as much as a bowling ball. Wow. And turned us loose on the campus to shoot film. And it amazed me. It was like I could, I could report doubly. I could write and I could put pictures to those words. And that's when I decided that the broadcast form of, of journalism might be really interesting. And I was going to do whatever it took, work and save, so that I could get to the University of Wisconsin to get my degree. And, and you managed to do that, and along the way, you, your entree into Channel 6 was kind of an interesting path, wasn't it? <laughs> well, you know, you do a little of everything when you first start out in this business, and I started at Channel 3 in Madison, and I did news during the week and sports on weekends. And I maintained that I was the world's worst sportscaster, but apparently when Channel 6 had an opening in sports, they saw that there was someone in Madison that they might be interested in, and Carl Zimmerman called me and offered me a job 
doing sports for Channel 6. And I told him that while I would fight for the right woman to have that job, because believe me, there weren't you know, many, if any at all, in the state of Wisconsin at that time, I wasn't the right woman. I didn't have the passion for sports. I had a passion for news, and I asked that he please remember me when a news opening came, and bless his heart, he did. And that's wonderful. You could have been the Jesse Garcia of your day. <laughs> well, and, and she's darn good. <laughs> she is. She is. She's very good. But uh, but, but all together, so you end up uh, joining Channel 6, TV 6, and the one thing I always remember, when the first promo that I ever saw running for TV 6 News <laughs> ran, you were listed as the zoo reporter. The zoo reporter. You know, I grew up reading the Milwaukee Journal's green sheet, and there was a great reporter, the late Alicia Armstrong, who used to write about the Milwaukee County Zoo, and I loved animals. So after many days of, you know, covering fires and and politics and news conferences and all those things, I would say to the news director, turn me loose. Uh, Let me go to the zoo. I'll turn a couple of feature stories for you. I need a break from (laughs) the negative. And and they would always say, go ahead, because I'd come back with a a, a basket full of stories that they could use for the newscast. So so I really did become associated, um, but not exclusively with the zoo, although I enjoyed it. You probably alone made George Spidell a, a celebrity all over Milwaukee. Well, he was pretty pretty popular on his own before then, but I'll have you know, he named two bears at the zoo after me, two bear cubs. Really? And I think the one named Jill was okay with it. The one who got my middle name, Gertrude, never forgave me. <laughs> So, so you, so what happens from there, from zoo reporter into general reporting, and you were doing that anyway, but then you move into an anchor chair, and eventually what happens is uh, the news director's job. Now, when you end up get, you know, getting the opportunity to do that, what, first of all, wh- what, did you, what were your thoughts when you were first offered that opportunity? <laughs> Well, it was really interesting because the, the news director uh, at the time called me in and said he'd just been hired away by CBS to run the Chicago Bureau. And he said he was asked, was there anyone internally that should be considered as a candidate? And he said, I thought about you. Now, Ted, I think I can tell you that the reason that that might have happened is that I tended to volunteer for a lot of things. I'm a big believer that you shouldn't come in to your bosses and say, somebody ought to, I know about a problem, somebody ought to do something about it. Mm -hmm. If you see something that can be improved, don't just come in with the problem, come in with a solution. And don't just look at your own benefit, look at what works for everybody. So I tended to volunteer for a number of things. In fact, I tell when I do talks to student groups, just about everything good that's ever happened to me in my life came when I volunteered for something, never expecting any more would come of it. Mm -hmm. That's how I became an anchor. I volunteered to host the Channel 10 auction when they asked for volunteers, and people at Channel 6 saw their reporter doing a hosting job and said, gee, she might be an anchor. Never thought that would happen. Same thing with being a news director. It was taking an interest in the overall benefit of the station and you know in helping other people in in the organization but they took a they took a tremendous risk in fact when henry j davis who was then the general manager informed me he didn't i didn't just get the job i had to write a business plan and 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 put that together and and carl zimmerman had also encouraged me to do this um he told me that the home office of this corporation that owned the station said are you crazy? Mm-hmm. An untested 27 year old woman, never had management experience, had never worked in anything other than the reporting and anchoring side of things, is now taking over a multi million dollar budget with um, union contracts to negotiate, technology to order, contracts uh, to, to negotiate, vendors to work with, all of that. Um, and, they, and they took a risk. Well, uh, so you put together the business plan, turned it in, and you were hired. And I'm just wondering if you ended up feeling like Robert Redford at the end of the movie, The President, where he <laughs> just end, ends up turning to somebody and says, now what do I do? <laughs> Ted, the, the last night before I became news director, I was driving home from the station, and I said, this is the last night that I'll ever drive home, and if news breaks... They'll call me. Mm-hmm. Now I have to call them. Oh my gosh, how do I know how to do that? 
<laughs> and and it was that it was that idea of of now being responsible for everything that just you know I was it, it really struck the, the magnitude of it struck me. But I have to tell you that that I absolutely loved it. I was able to work for twenty five years in a television station, grow a culture, and have just tremendous people who I still keep touch with to this day. When the when the book signing when the when the book rolled out a couple of weeks ago. There was a, a book signing, and, and you know who hosted it? Andy Potus and his wife, Kathy Potus. Andy was yeah. my boss for many years at Channel 6, right. and lots of people who worked in that newsroom and still do came, and it was just, and people from the community, and it was just wonderful. It, it, it has to be, and that's the thing, too, because all together, you know, obviously there was an observation that your skills were being sharpened while you were in that newsroom, and all together they saw a quality in you, and they, I'm sure it happens to millions of people around the country where they find a quality in somebody, and they say, you're the one that can do it, and they shrink away from it. Well, but I think that, that that's our job as leaders. Mm-hmm. It's to look for people who don't just write them off as complainers or whiners. If they come and tell you that something can be better, teach them how to tell you how to make things better. Because I think that in so many cases, there's untapped potential, and it's up to the boss to really to really take those risks, but make them calculated risks. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You don't. You don't just. Um, you don't go to bat for just everybody. They do have to earn it, but show them what it's like to earn it. And that's where that feedback comes in. Right. It's kind of like a controlled way of throwing things in their lap and seeing what happens. Oh, what I tell what I tell managers is. If you are doing a review of someone, and the, and the first time an employee hears in an annual review that they're doing something wrong, shame on you. Mm-hmm. Why did it take you a year to sit down with this person and tell them that they're doing something wrong? And conversely, why did it take you a year to tell them they're doing something really well? One of the things that you can do to keep your people motivated is to give them consistent, specific, and sincere feedback and don't do the kinds of things that erase praise for example let me let me give you let me give you some great erased praise it goes like this ted i really like this newscast but you really need to have a little bit more of a, a, a better pace to it mm. now what's happened is the word but erased everything that came before it that's true so how do you turn that around? Well, Ted, I listened to your newscast today. I particularly liked the two guests you had at the beginning because the give and take was really excellent, and I think that was your touch in there. And in the future, if you, if you added one more guest, I bet it would keep the pace up. Now what's happened? I gave you specifics of what worked, and instead of saying, but mm-hmm. this was wrong, I said, and in the future... Yeah, I take you in a positive direction. That makes all the difference in the world. So it isn't enough just to teach from your mistakes, but every chance I have to illustrate the wrong way of doing something by telling a story of how I screwed up, I'll do it. Because then what people know is that you're not just a know-it-all telling them this is the only way to do it. What you're telling them is, in the course of my career, I had some absolute joys as a boss. Mm -hmm. I also had people, fortunately for me, forgive me for some of the things that I did wrong. I tell a story in the book about a wonderful chief photographer who came into my office one day and said, why is everybody here more important than I am to you? And I was stunned because I thought this is the most terrific guy and I thought he knew how much I respected him. And I said, what's wrong? And he said to me, do you know that every time I'm here in your office, if anybody else comes and knocks on the door, you say, yeah, come on in, we're just talking. Now, the chief photographer, who I had great respect for, was an introvert. Mm -hmm. He was a person who didn't like a room full of people and sometimes just wanted one-on-one time. And I said to him, oh, my gosh. I said, I always thought that you and I were both managers, so we start early together and stay late together, and if people need us, we stop what we're doing and talk. And he said, well, that's all true, but sometimes I just need your undivided attention, and one more person in the room doesn't necessarily give me that. But it took him years of working with me 
to get up either the frustration or the nerve to confront me about it. Right. And so I tell stories like that because he's still my friend to this day, and he came to the book signing, and we laughed about that story. <laughs> but you have to build enough credits with people on doing things well so that they will have the courage to come and tell you when you've really gotten in your own way. 